Coming up, infidelity threatened to end their marriage, but God had other plans, and the power of forgiveness allows a couple to move beyond addiction. Welcome to the 700 Club Canada, and today our theme is, Can God Make Me Whole? I hope so. Uh, well, I hope so too, <laughs> and I, I think that's a really good question, because yeah. I think a lot of people feel fractured, fragmented. And the interesting thing about that word whole actually can be used as an adjective, like a part of a whole, like a puzzle. And so I think a lot of people feel like that, and they're trying to put all the pieces together, but it can also be a noun, and that means something complete within itself. Mm. And so I think the answer to the question isn't actually looking at you, it's looking at God, who is whole. He is complete in himself, and he can put you all the pieces back together. So the answer, of course, is yes, with God's help, you can be whole. Well, I can tell you, Bill, I did a lot of puzzles. <laughs> in fact, every one of our kids got us a puzzle. I don't know what that's saying. I'm getting old. But we sat and did some puzzles over the holidays, and there's such a satisfying feeling when that final piece goes we fight. in. In our family, oh, we fight you. over who gets, yeah, who gets, who gets to put, put the last piece in. There's just a satisfaction of wholeness yes when the picture comes together and I hate tearing it apart you know well this is how God stepped in at the lowest point of Brian and Alicia's marriage Brian and Alicia have been married for more than 20 years they met as teenagers and fell in love fast after their paths crossed at a grocery store he jokingly says I was stalking him <laughs> but um, he was in the grocery, you know, stalking, and me and my, my mother and my sisters, we saw him, we thought he was just super cute. I knew the first time I seen her that she was definitely the one. We dated about six months, and then nine months after that, we were married on April 12th, um, 1997. They spent the first couple years getting to know each other better, but eventually their time together lessened and tension was building between them. We were, uh, I had just started nursing school, so I was gone all day. And, you know, Brian worked um, second shifts. And then when we would connect on the weekends, it was arguing about, um, I think it was a lack of intimacy, the lack of time together. We just, we both wanted what we wanted and we wasn't willing to give. And I think that's where things really start spiraling downward. Meanwhile, their family was growing but their arguments escalated and would often lead to Brian leaving home for weeks, even months at a time. Brian became a successful contractor and prided himself in being a provider, but he filled a void he felt with familiar vices. He found the attention he was looking for in other women. Deep down, I knew what was going on, but um, I was still trying to be a somewhat good husband, if that makes sense, and provide and and keep things at home intact. Um, I was hiding the alcohol in my truck, um, hiding my phone in my truck in the evenings in case somebody would call or reach out to me so she would know and hiding. I'd go home at night, take showers, get out of the shower, but still felt dirty. I knew right and wrong. I just couldn't get free from the things of the world no matter how hard I tried. Several years had passed and Alicia had given birth to their second child when Brian's secrets came to light. I remember waking up one morning at 6 a.m. to the phone ringing. At that moment, my world shattered. Never in my mind would have ever thought that, that my husband would, would be cheating on me. Alicia forgave him and agreed to work on their relationship. But later, when the infidelities continued, Alicia finally reached her breaking point and filed for divorce. Feeling rejected and hopeless, she attempted suicide. After the fourth affair, I had given up all hope. Um, I had filed for divorce. I had been on an antidepressant for about three years, and I decided that I was going to overdose on those pills. And so when Brian came to get the kids one day, I would asked him if he would pick up my prescription. It was a full three months. And so when he brought them back, took the children and left, I was gonna take them all. And um, when I opened the bottle, there was only three pills inside. And so when I contacted Brian to find out where the rest of them was, there should have been hundreds, he said that the pharmacy had, they couldn't account for them, they were just gone. At my lowest moment was when God stepped in 
and saved my life. When I asked God, you know, what to do about Brian, and so lovingly, he just asked me, would you give him one more chance? As Alicia began to let God heal her heart, Brian was facing the man he had become. I had tried to commit suicide myself down at my grandfather's farm. I'd, you know, taken a gun and put it underneath my chin and pulled the trigger, and, you know, of course, it didn't go off. I remember God telling me, this is your last chance, and knew that I had to change as a dad and a husband, and that was a big turning, turning point for me. Broken and desperate, he surrendered his heart to God. Brian moved back into their home. Together, they participated in couples counseling and committed to keeping God first in their marriage while they rebuilt their communication and trust. Got rid of my worldly friends. I'd made a promise to myself that I would never get in a truck and leave like I had so many times in the past. I would go outside and sit and just pray. It brought me to a really strong relationship with him, which in turn turned into a strong relationship with Alicia and the kids. When we incorporated God back in, when we invited him back in, when we repented for removing him, he just started to rebuild our marriage and our love for one another. Brian and Alicia say their love for each other is stronger than ever. And it's all because they learn to love each other as Christ loves them. Where it is today, uh, it's almost like trying to imagine heaven. You know, as much as we can imagine, as good as it'd be, we'll, we'll still be blown away on the day we get there. And uh, I feel the same way with our marriage. Today, what it is, uh -huh. we're best friends. We love spending time with each other, and uh, I can't imagine waking up a day without her by my side or ending a day without her by my side. Well, that's a beautiful reminder of what, when we're willing to bring God into our marriage, there's actually hope for healing and restoration. You know, it's easy actually to keep God out of your marriage. You can let all the pressures of life, maybe raising kids, stresses of the day, just finances, work, you name it, overwhelm you. Instead of bringing those things to God, you tend to take it out on each other. Does that resonate with you? I love this illustration of what it actually looks like when you bring God into your marriage. It's like two people can be, you know, apart. But as each one of you moves towards God, bringing your concerns, you know, talking to God about things, as you move towards God, as you pray, guess where you find each other? Right there. It's this illustration of this triangle. So maybe you feel really distant from your spouse right now. I encourage you just move towards God, welcome him to every part of your life, into your marriage. And as you do that together, you're going to find each other but you need to be willing to invite God into your marriage. Start praying for your marriage. Get help as an individual. If, you're, if your partner isn't willing, you go get help, but start praying together and get help to move forward through this rough season and find a way to a healthy marriage because there is a way. Ecclesiastes uh, 4 verse 12 says, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better for a triple bra braided cord is not easily broken. There's that, that image of the triangle of two people can, you know, try to work it out on their own. But as you move towards God, you find that unity. We have a resource. It's free. It's called Love and Marriage. And if you need some help, maybe some prayer support, call us right now. 1-855-759-0700. We want to pray for you, support you, and resource you. Well, suffering part of God's plan? Bill looks into this question when we return with Ask Anything. Our question today is, is suffering a part of God's plan? 
And the obvious answer is no, of, of course not. God created a perfect world and a way for this world to function properly. See, suffering is a result of human beings going against God's plan. So blaming God for suffering is like driving the wrong way on a one-way street, getting in an accident, and then blaming the traffic engineers or the people who made the signs for your accident. But that being said, God can take our suffering and transform it into purpose. Here's what I've learned. Sometimes our suffering is an opportunity to realign your life. Kind of like on your GPS when you're going the wrong way, it says make a U-turn, make a U-turn. It's a warning. Turn around. That's what we call repentance. Sometimes suffering is also to share hope with someone else. I remember times when I've been in the hospital and had the opportunity to share with someone else who is suffering the hope that I had in Christ. Sometimes our suffering is actually a way to build up our faith. Just like when you work out, you actually tear muscle, and if you do it properly and recover, that muscle becomes stronger. That's why in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8, it says, Paul speaking, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take my suffering away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, hardships, persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So is suffering a part of God's plan? Absolutely not. But if you let him, he can take your suffering and transform it into purpose. Even though I had a wonderful wife and then we had children and I had a great job, I was walking around lonely all the time because I truly felt I was the only one dealing with this issue. Dave had a secret. As a boy, he accidentally found pornography. It seemed to help him deal with loneliness. I remember distinctly the woman on the front cover. I saw someone who was going to nurture me, was going to take care of me, was going to be there for me. But instead, it brought him guilt and shame all the way into adulthood. Even after he married Meg, he continued his addiction to pornography. The last thing I wanted anyone to know was to find out what I was doing and what was going on inside me. From my perspective, our marriage was normal. We had stressors, we had challenges, we'd work them through. I very much led a double life. I was not totally 100% present in anything we did as a family. Dave traveled frequently for his sales job. The time alone led to more temptation. Every time I acted out, there was more reason to believe I was a horrible, rotten person. Although he was a Christian, Dave couldn't fully surrender his addiction. I was praying constantly that God would take it away. But I became discouraged when pressure or anxiety would mount and I would chose to act out again. When a friend stepped down from his church leadership position because of sexual addiction, Dave saw it as an opportunity to finally confess. But I still held on to some of the darkest parts of my addiction in fear that she would still end up leaving me. So I did what I thought I should do as a good Christian wife. I forgave him, and we moved on. Dave joined a men's sexual accountability group at his church. But even there, he was afraid to admit everything. I still wasn't 100% honest, because where my addiction had gone, I wasn't hearing anybody else talking about that aspect of it. I'm praying that, that God would give him freedom. I'm praying that he would uh, be satisfied you know, with his wife, I'm praying that he would have integrity in every aspect of his life. Meg thought their problems were being resolved. But over the next two years, as Dave's addiction escalated, shame tightened its hold on him. There were multiple times that I would confess to Meg, but there would always be things I would leave out. And every time I did that, the addiction increased in, in, in intensity. Then in March of 2001, while on a business trip, Dave moved beyond pornography. I had called a prostitute. She came over. We engaged in sex. And at that point, that was it. He was horrified at how far his porn addiction had taken him. In his despair, he cried out to God. God said, Dave, it is time. You need to confess everything to Meg, 
And if you don't stop doing what you're doing, you will die. I felt him turn his face from me. And I felt a loneliness that I have never, ever felt. I think the significance of that was him saying, you thought you were alone, but you weren't alone. Because this is what loneliness really looks like. But I'm here. Dave returned home early from his trip, determined to tell Meg everything. He held a notebook filled with a full confession. And then that fear comes back. Man, you're not even getting halfway through this, and she's out the door. Are you kidding me? I feel the pressure. Well, I can't tell her everything. But God is still saying, no, you need to tell her everything. Over the next three days, he confessed everything, including the affair. My flesh wanted to run, wanted to just leave, wanted to figure out the quickest way to make that level of pain stop. I had been praying and asking God for those three days, why? He said, if you don't extend my grace to him, he may never know it. I wasn't responsible for any of the choices Dave made, but now I had a responsibility. How would I respond? And so with a strength that was definitely not my own, I just put my arm on Dave's shoulder and uh, he, he broke. I truly believe I was saved at that point. Not spiritually, but physically saved, forgiven, loved, God's arms around me. That was the most amazing time in my life. I was obedient to God's call for me to act with grace. And so I believe that began the forgiveness process. Dave and Meg both got counseling and worked on being open and honest in all areas of their marriage. It was a long road, but their love, trust, and commitment to one another is stronger than ever. Since 2009, Dave has been free of his sexual addiction. To have someone who you know has your back, who you trust, who, who uh, you want to spend time with and share the same dreams for the future, that's an incredible gift. I know that I'm not worthless because of what God has done in my recovery, but more importantly, in, our, in my marriage. I am married to my best friend. Everything that God has done for us, He can do for you. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13 says, For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So today we start with the question, can God make me whole? But if you read this passage, it sounds like the word of God cuts us up. So which is it? What's going on here? Well, I think to understand that, you need to understand the analogy of a surgeon. Sometimes in order for a surgeon to make you whole the way you are supposed to function, he may need to cut some things out like cancer or add some new things like a new heart. So in order to be whole, you need the master surgeon, God himself, to do his work in your life. You have to step into the light, let him assess your situation and let him heal you. As long as you choose to remain in the darkness, just like Dave did in that story with his addiction, you will never fully be whole. But maybe today you're at a desperate point too, just like Dave. Maybe you don't know where to turn. Maybe you've tried everything in your own strength to fix it and you don't know where to turn next. Could I encourage you? There is a God who is waiting. If you step into his love, into his light, he can, all, he can restore, rebuild, put you back together again. And we're here to help you. If, if you find yourself there right now, wherever you're at, call us at 1-855-759-0700. Someone is waiting to pray with you and believe with you for God to bring the freedom you need. And we also have this resource entitled Free Indeed. So call us today. Don't wait another moment. Don't wait another second. Deal with it today. Let God heal you today. Call us and let us pray with you. Well, up next, Lori returns with encouragement for anyone seeking to overcome an issue in their life.
There's an interesting cultural belief that is rather subtle but destructive if you believe it's true. What is it? Well, it's based on an ancient belief called dualism. Dualism argues that there are two equal and opposing realities, good and evil. These forces are in an eternal battle with one another. Now you might think, well, that's true. The Bible teaches there's two opposing realities, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Satan. Well, here's the difference. Dualism says they are equal in strength and have always existed. Well, the Bible tells us that God and Satan are not equals, and that Satan is a created being that came into existence at a time in the past when God created him. Therefore, there's not been an eternal struggle between God and the devil, and there will be an end to Satan and his kingdom. Revelation 20 verse 10 tells us the end of the story. It says, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Well, there will come a time when evil will end. But in the meantime, what are we to do with the evil that we see in this world and the effects of it on our own lives? Well, you need to first know and believe that God has already won the battle. That's why Jesus came. He broke into a world that was oppressed by sin and Satan, and he conquered it. Colossians 2.15 says, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Jesus is the king of God's kingdom, and he offers anyone who will trust their lives to his leadership to live free from the power of sin and Satan. Now, evil is still present in this world until Satan's final judgment, but it doesn't have power over those who are part of God's kingdom. Anyone who aligns with the kingdom of God and welcomes the rule and reign of Christ in their life is set free from the power of sin and Satan. And this is why we are warned not to think like the world or buy into false beliefs like dualism. This is why the Bible is good news. It not only tells us that good wins, but that goodness is found in a God who loves people, a God that is more powerful than Satan and evil, a God that has eternal existed and has no end, a God who is not just interested and concerned for our spiritual well-being, but also cares about our physical, emotional, and relational well-being. That's why Jesus came, to conquer sin and Satan and to show us what it looks like to be human, to be an image bearer, reflector of God and live free from the power of sin, even while we're still experiencing evil around us. Why does this matter? Well, if you think that God and Satan are equal, you'll live in fear and miss out on the freedom that's available to you now in this life. You'll also think that God only cares about spiritual things and miss out on his care for every part of you. So today, know that God is supreme over every power in heaven and on earth. He cares about every part of your life. We know how the story ends, and that brings us hope and help for each day. And that's Courageous Living. Our question today was, is suffering a part of God's plan? And if you're suffering, maybe you're even questioning if God has a plan at all. Well, we have a great resource. Uh, it's our newest teaching from Gordon Robertson called Divine Direction with a 21-day devotional, and it'll help you discover God's will for your life. And you can receive that today by becoming a partner for as little as $20 a month. And when you do join, you can join using Pledge Express, which is an automatic monthly withdrawal, which makes it easier for you and, and actually helps us on administrative costs as well. So why not call at 1-855-759-0700, get that great resource and partner with us to make a difference. I want to discuss with you three important questions. The answers to which will determine the course of your life. Where do you come from? Who are you? Where are you going? Divine Direction, God's Blueprint for Your Future. The latest audio teaching from Gordon Robertson. What does it really mean to be a child of God? What does it really mean to belong to God? What does it really mean that I'm going to God? In this teaching, you'll discover God's design for your life, your true identity in Christ. 
how to find purpose and direction, plus a daily devotional to strengthen your faith. When God looks at you, he's saying, you're exceptional. You are here for the very purpose that I thought of before the foundation of the world. When you have that picture of yourself, it changes everything. Divine Direction, God's Blueprint for Your Future, available now. Well, today we have tackled a very difficult subject, and it's suffering. And of course, the question is always connected. If God has a perfect plan and works all things together for good, why is there even suffering in the first place? And I think we explored, you explored it in Courageous Living. There's a, there's a darkness. And I also explored this idea that it's a choice that we make. And so we're either living in darkness where suffering exists or in the light. And we're caught in what I call the in-between. God is bringing us perfectly to the light. But in the meantime, we have to walk through some of the darkness to get there. Yeah, it's so true, this uh, now and not yet, yeah. as we can call it. Like, we can experience God now in our life and yeah. all that he has for us, but there's that ultimate not yet can we fully experience the f until evil is dealt with. Right. Because when evil is dealt with, because suffering was not God's idea, hmm. right? It's a result of evil in this world. Well, and I think one of the questions people say, why, why doesn't God just eradicate evil? And the answer is because there's some evil in me. And if he destroyed everything that was evil, he'd have to destroy me. So he's in a process of healing and restoring yeah. if I choose to follow him. I think that is really, really yeah, powerful. That's so true. And we want to pray for you because yeah. in the middle, and between the now and the not yeah. yet, and as you're working through, we want to pray with you. Terry, you said, pray for God to heal my heart and for my marriage to be restored. And Susan said, I need prayer for my marriage. Mm. And so why don't you pray for these marriages? Yeah. Well, Lord, I do pray for Terry's heart because mm. I know that so often in relationships like marriage, it has so much to do with our own heart. So mm. I pray you would heal her heart. And I pray that you would restore her marriage. And Lord, I also pray for Susan's marriage because it needs healing as well. Would you heal and redeem there? Lord, would you take what is broken and make it new? And I do pray for those watching who also need prayer for their marriages, that they would draw close to you, that they would know your presence, even in the middle of difficulty, and that you would heal these relationships in Jesus' name, amen. Our power verse for today is found in 1 John 4, 7, where it says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Well, that's a powerful truth. No matter the evil we experience in the that's world, right. the suffering we go through, God loves us. He's with you. Thanks for watching. Be, be encouraged today. To contact us, visit 700club.ca.